Sila, virtues. Virtues or moral conduct is the foundation of a civil and harmonious society. As such, the practice of virtues is praised not only by religionists but also atheists. Even people who do not believe in the existence of a god believe in the goodness of virtues. Philosophers, poets and scientists alike all can agree on this one thing, that the practice of virtues is good for society. Many religions see the practice of virtues as an end in itself. It is the goal of these religionists that by practicing virtues, they can be rewarded by being reborn in heaven. In this aspect, the Buddhists too believe that the practice of generosity and good moral conduct can lead one to a better rebirth in heaven. However, for true Buddhists, the practice of virtues is not an end in itself, but merely a mean to an end. For Buddhists, the Pali word sila is virtues or moral conduct, the cultivation of which leads to the establishment of further foundation for mental purification, bhavana. Outwardly, sila is seen as manifested in right speech, right actions and right livelihood of the Noble Eightfold Path and the Five Precepts, Panchasila. However, the benefit of practicing sila is not in the outward appearances, but rather like dana, the inner state and attitude of the mind. Thus, the practice of sila begins with the most basic avoidance of evils, through the performance of good deeds to the achievement of the most sublime mental states. The Rewards of Virtues At the grossest level, the practice of virtues pro protects us from breaking the laws of man, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and mentally in intoxicated can get us into trouble with the laws. The practice of virtues thus prevents us from getting negative or unwanted consequences. We can keep our conscience hiri clear, our mind free from guilt and remorse or tapa, and live a life without fear, a baya. On the other hand, those who practice virtues properly can also expect good returns for their efforts. In Diga Nikaya number 16, five rewards are mentioned for those who practice sila diligently. They are 1. Success in life or an increase in wealth through diligence. 2. A favorable reputation. 3. Self-confidence in society in the presence of nobles, brahmans, householders and ascetics. 4. A serene death. And 5. A good rebirth. For true spiritual seekers, the real rewards are in the form of attaining the right mental state that leads to final liberation. Such mental states are achievable as ex as explained in Anguttara Nikaya 10.1 thus. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Groove, Anatta Pindika's monastery. At that time, the Venerable Ananda approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him and asked, What Lord is the benefit of virtuous ways of conduct? What is their reward? Non-remorse, Ananda, is the benefit and reward of virtuous ways of conduct. And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of non-remorse? Gladness, Ananda. And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of gladness? Joy. And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of joy? Serenity. And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of serenity? Happiness. And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of happiness? Concentration of the mind. 
And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of concentration? Knowledge of vision of things as they really are. And what, Lord, is the benefit and reward of knowledge and vision of things as they really are? Revulsion and dispassion. And what, Lord, is the benefit of reward and reward of revulsion and dispassion? The knowledge and vision of liberation. Hence, Ananda, virtuous ways of conduct have non-remorse as their benefit and reward. Non-remorse has gladness as its benefit and reward. Gladness has joy as its benefit and reward. Joy has serenity as its benefit and reward. Serenity has happiness as its benefit and reward. Happiness has concentration as its benefit and reward. Concentration has knowledge and vision of things as they really are as its benefit and reward. Knowledge of vision of things as they really are has revulsion and dispassion as its benefit and reward. Revulsion and dispassion have the knowledge and vision of liberation as their benefit and reward. In this way, Ananda, virtuous ways of conduct lead step by step to the highest. Thus, like a staircase, the practice of virtues leads gradually to the highest achievement. In addition, there is no need for volitional exertion as one stage naturally leads to the next higher stage. According to Anguttara Nikaya 10.2 Our practice of moral conduct should not end at the five precepts as they are the minimal standard of conduct. We should instead aim for the highest possible moral conduct as exemplified by Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh in his writing below. The five precepts of Thich Nhat Hanh The first mindfulness training reverence for life. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I vow to cultivate compassion and learn ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants and minerals. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to condone any act of killing in the world, in my thinking or in my way of life. The second mindfulness training, generosity. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing and oppression, I vow to cultivate loving kindness and learn ways to work for the well-being of people, animals, plants and minerals. I vow to practice generosity by sharing my time, energy and material resources with those who are in real need. I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. I will respect the property of others, but I will prevent others from profiting from human suffering or the suffering of other species on earth. The third mindfulness training, sexual responsibility. Aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I vow to cultivate responsibility and learn ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families and society. I am determined not to engage in sexual relations without love and a long-term commitment. To preserve the happiness of myself and others, I am determined to respect my commitments and the commitments of others. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to protect couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. The fourth mindfulness training, deep listening and loving speech. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful speech and the inability to listen to others, I vow to cultivate loving speech and deep listening in order to bring joy and happiness to others and to relieve others of their suffering. Knowing that words can create happiness or suffering, I vow to learn to speak truthfully with words that inspire self-confidence, joy and hope. I am determined not to spread news that I do not know to be certain and not to criticize or condemn things of which I am not sure. I will refrain from uttering words that can cause division or discord 
or that can cause the family or the community to break. I will make all efforts to reconcile and resolve all conflicts, however small. The fifth mindfulness training, mindful consumption. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I vow to cultivate good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, and my society by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I vow to ingest only items that preserve peace, well-being, and joy in my body, in my consciousness, and in the collective body and consciousness of my family and society. I am determined not to use alcohol or any other intoxicant or to ingest food or other items that contain toxins, such as certain TV programs, magazines, books, films, and conversations. I am aware that to damage my body or my consciousness with these poisons is to betray my ancestors, my parents, my society, and future generations. I will work to transform violence, fear, anger, and confusion in myself and in society by practicing a diet for myself and for society. I understand that a proper diet is crucial for self-transformation and for the transformation of society. So, as can be seen from the above, practicing the five precepts is part and parcel of our daily mindfulness training, resulting in positive outward manifestations in actions and speech. Right speech Right speech is the third factor in the Noble Eightfold Path. According to the Vacha Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya 5.198, Five characteristics of right speech are 1. Spoken at the right time 2. Spoken in truth 3. Spoken affectionately 4. Spoken beneficially and 5. Spoken with a mind of goodwill In the Abhaya Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya No. 58, the Buddha described his stance towards proper speech as thus. 1. In the case of words that the Tathagata knows to be unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, or not connected with the goal, unendearing and disagreeable to others, he does not say them. 2. In the case of words that the Tathagata knows to be factual, true, unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable to others, he does not say them. 3. In the case of words that the Tathagata knows to be factual, true, beneficial, but unendearing and disagreeable to others, he has a sense of the proper time for saying them. 4. In the case of words that the Tathagata knows to be unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, but endearing and agreeable to others, he does not say them. 5. In the case of words that the Tathagata knows to be factual, true, unbeneficial, but endearing and agreeable to others, he does not say them. 6. In the case of words that the Tathagata knows to be factual, true, beneficial, and endearing and agreeable to others, he has a sense of the proper time for saying them. Why is that? because the Tathagata has sympathy for living beings. Thus, we can conclude from these two suttas that right speech is one in which 1. Truth is spoken. 2. The intention or motivation for the speech is good, that is, the speaker has no ulterior motive or malice, and it is not motivated by greed, hatred or delusion. 3. The speech is beneficial to the listener when spoken. 4. It is spoken at the proper time and place. And 5. It is spoken with kindness or affectionately, not harshly or angrily. Right Action Right action is the fourth factor in the Noble Eightfold Path and covers the first three factors of the five precepts. Specifically, they are 1. Not killing or taking of lives 
2. Not stealing or taking what is not given. 3. No adultery or sexual misconducts. Again, it should be stressed here that the above guidelines are simply the minimum standard. Instead of not killing, we should develop ourselves to have reverence and respect for all lives, both humans and animals. So simply not killing is not good enough for a true cultivator. One must go further to live with great reverence for life, seeing it as sacred. The goal of practice is not just to reduce hatred, but to increase loving kindness or metta for all living beings. Likewise, for the second precept of not stealing, we develop ourselves further by reducing greed and increasing generosity. This practice, when taken to its ultimate high level, leads to non-attachment to people, things and events. The third precept of avoiding sexual misconducts when cultivated properly leads to social harmony, honest relationships and trust, which are foundations for peaceful coexistence. Right Livelihood Right livelihood is the fifth factor in the Noble Eightfold Path. It refers to earning a living in an honest way, producing or providing goods and services that are beneficial to society as a whole. In this respect, the Buddha specifically singled out five types of livelihood to be avoided. They are 1. Dealing with weapons 2. Dealing with human trade such as sex trafficking, prostitution, slavery 3. Dealing with animal meats 4. Dealing with intoxicants such as alcohol and drugs and 5. Dealing with poisons. This is found in Vanija Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya 5.177. In the Diga Janu Sutta in Anguttara Nikaya 8.54, the Buddha also has good and practical advice for lay people in their quest for happiness and well being in this life and in future lives. There are four qualities that lead to a lay person's happiness and well-being in this life. These are 1. Being consummate in initiative. This refers to having strong initiative and dedication to constantly improve one's knowledge and skills in one's trade, to be the best that one can be in one's trade or career. 2. Being consummate in vigilance. This refers to being vigilant against the loss of one's wealth due to theft, king's forfeiture, destruction by fire or water, or other calamities. 3. Admirable friendship or Kalyana Mitta. This refers to one's choice in friendship. Choosing to be friendly with people of good virtues and spiritual practice can lead to happiness and well-being. A spiritual friend or Kalyana Mitta is one who supports, encourages and emulates the good practice of Dharma. It is important to have good spiritual friends in our spiritual practice who will help us and support us when we are discouraged or disheartened by home and worldly affairs that overwhelm us momentarily. 4. Maintaining one's livelihood in tune this refers to living a moderate lifestyle based on one's own income. Firstly, one should not spend in excess of one's income or else one will incur debts. Secondly, one should also not be too stingy, living like a poor man when one has the means for better food, clothing, home and properties. Furthermore, the Buddha listed four ways in which one can lose one's properties. They are debauchery in sex, debauchery in drinking, debauchery in gambling, and having evil friends and companions. Lastly, the Buddha listed four ways in which happiness and well-being can be achieved in future lives too. They are 1. Consummate in conviction or sadda. Consummate in virtues or sila. Consummate in generosity or dana. Consummate in discernment. Up to this point, we have already covered the first three.